Hello and welcome to another video. So this time around, we want to talk about an area that was requested semi-recently from memory uh, about how to go about structuring and organizing a large project. And this is quite different to how we work things with small projects. Uh, and in particular, if you've had a lot of experience with small projects going to a large project, uh, there's a lot of things that are needed there that you might not realize. And the reverse is true. Uh, that was actually my experience. of I, I went from only working on very large projects to then working on very small projects. And that was actually a real struggle of trying to apply techniques from large projects to small ones. And that didn't, that didn't really work so well. Uh, so there was a lot of learning I had to do there. So I want to try and uh, share my sort of guidance of how to go about sort of structuring a large project. And I'm going to focus mostly on the technical side of things. So I'm not going to look too much at things like, you know, processes, procedures there, uh, and, you know, production side of things more in general. I want to mostly focus on things from an actual technical point of view uh, that we can be doing there. So let's begin. So when we're talking about a large project, I'm talking about something where you've either got you know, a lot of people or you've got you know, something that's happening over a large time period, um, something where the scale of the project matters. So there's a bunch of things that we need to consider and some of the big ones that we need to consider that I'm going to dive into a lot more detail on are finding where, you know, the art, the audio, the data, code for particular things are, is a massive aspect. Avoiding long iteration times when you're working on a large project. And so sort of this is key to making a good game is lots of iteration. So being able to find ways of making that as fast as possible is really important. Designing systems that scale is a big factor and not just scale in terms of, okay, you know, this might need to be handling a large amount of data or might need to be running really rapidly, but also something where it's a case of, okay, this system, we're going to be building and expanding upon it for months, even years. And it might be a case of decisions made at the very beginning. You have to then live with them for many years. So being able to design systems in that regard is really important. Picking the right tools and technologies matter. Again, that idea of stuff that we're going to have to live with for an extended period. So making those choices you know, early on and making the right choices, or at least as close to the right choice as possible, is really important and is something we need to you know, look at ways of doing that. And a big thing, version control and automation, which get into in more detail, but those are really, really important with large projects. Uh, version control, I would also argue, is important with any project, whether it is small, medium, or large. Version control is crucial. And please, please uh, be making sure you're using version control and really important thing there that version control doesn't mean that you have, you know, 10 copies of a file with one where it's like, cool, here's one with this date, here's one with this, here's the one that's final, here's the final final or the finally final final one. Uh, I mean, actually using a proper version control system. So these are the main things that I'm going to look at in a bit more detail uh, throughout this. So, okay, tracking down things. Finding things easily is really, really, really important. You know, it saves a lot of time because if it takes ages to track down something, then that's a lot of time wasted. It gets very frustrating because this is something that people are going to be doing every day on the project. And if people can't find things or it's really frustrating to find them, you'll end up with duplicated things being created. So you end up with time wasted, a lot of frustration, uh, and things being created that don't need to be. It's a really bad sort of setup. So making it easy to find things is really important. So a good naming convention for your files, uh, 
uh, is really, really important. And there's not one perfect naming convention, but a good naming convention does have a number of key things in, in mind. And, in, and good naming conventions always have a bunch of things in common. So they're clear. It should be straightforward, should be unambiguous of how something should be named. If it is ambiguous, then make a decision and update the naming convention. It should be consistent. So it should be something where there's a logical pattern to it, where it makes sense. It shouldn't be a case where it's, you know, okay, these things all follow this naming convention, but then these other set of files follow a completely opposite one. You know, there should be consistency there with it. And, really big thing, it needs to be documented. There is no point having a naming convention that is, you know, purely word of mouth or, you know, is documented in 10 different messages on like a Discord or Slack or something like that. Put it in a single document or wiki or whatever is, you know, being used for your project, but have it documented, keep it up to date, regularly maintain it, have it as a really useful resource then that new people starting can refer to. Now, something I'd recommend as a good basis for this is the one from Epic. Their naming convention guidelines uh, that they make available with Unreal are excellent. You know, these are ones that have been developed over decades of development. You know, they're working with other studios a huge amount. There's a lot of experience, a lot of iteration that has gone into these, and I think they're an excellent reference point. I more and more find myself uh, following those naming conventions. Uh, and their way of structuring like organizing the assets uh, is also, I think, a good reference point. I have a slightly different version of that, but still sort of based upon their one that I use these days for uh, my Unity projects. And I've talked about that before, and I'll put a link to that in the description. But generally, I group things. The At the very top level of the project, I have a common set of things which that is common data, common code, uh, common you know, audio, visual assets, something that I should be able to take that entire folder and transplant that into any other new project I start. So the idea behind that common one is that that gives a base where you know, things that you're needing to build all the time that are able to be transferable between projects go in that saves you time on future projects. So I usually have a common set. I then will also have a, okay, here is the project specific stuff. Again, has that, you create that split between the common and the project specific. And then I will have another one for third party stuff. So any, you know, add-ons, plugins, things like of that. The reason I put them in their own folder is because you'll have a structure in terms of naming convention folders, things like of that that you use for the common core, and you'd use the same thing for the uh, your game specific data and code. But the third party things you shouldn't be going and renaming those, so those tend to be a bit of a you know, hodgepodge of different styles because they'll be based upon the internal styles of you know, the particular developer or studios that have put those together. So by grouping them all in a third party folder, you know that, okay, this is a section where the process is you follow the naming convention that each particular one is used. So that's sort of how I generally recommend structuring things. But as I said, the one from Epic is a really, really good reference point. I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's excellent. And I find it makes it very easy to actually track down things. Uh, in a large project where that naming convention has been followed. So now on to iteration times. So being able to iterate rapidly, not just in code, but art, audio, design, is so important. Good games happen as part 
of you know, this rapid process of iterating, being able to see how something works, getting feedback on it, and improving it. That is the key to making a good game, is being able to iterate, get feedback, make further changes, and keep that process going. So we need to be able to iterate rapidly on things. So making things easy to find is going to be a big assist there. So that's something that why the naming convention side of things was first. So making it easy to find things is going to help. Using assemblies will really help on a code point of view. So I've talked a bit about assembly definitions before, and I'll link that also in the description. Assembly definitions allow us to partition our code. So what that means is when we change one of the files in that assembly, it only needs to recompile that assembly, which means on a large project where you might have hundreds, even thousands or more source files, it makes it go from rather than having to recompile everything, it only has to potentially recompile, you know, half a dozen or a dozen files. So using assembly definitions like that is going to make your iteration process much, much faster there. So that's something I really recommend. Setting up things like test levels for prototyping new features, testing existing ones. Anytime you're setting up a new feature, have a test level for it. Have levels where you can easily test out different, you know, if you've got, say, a system where it's procedurally uh, generating cities. Have a level where you can just load it up and you can just cycle through, making it regenerate different cities and testing different combinations like that. So making it that there's easy ways of testing any of the features and functionality within the game is really important. Having debug tools relates to this as well. So debug tools in terms of it might be you know, on-screen displays of key information. It might be things like a developer console that lets you put in cheat commands. Uh, that lets you, you know, make yourself invulnerable, lets you, you know, give yourself particular items or teleport to different locations. So having those debug tools is really important. And that's something where, you know, when setting up things like those debug tools, make sure you're talking to the team. Don't just set up debug tools that, okay, here's all the debug tools that the programmers need, because there's a giant swath of other people on the project. What are the tools that artists need? What are the tools that audio folks need? What do designers need? What do QA need? Think of the different sort of tools that everyone might need and talk to them and identify ones and get those set up early and make sure that those are doing what they need to to make those folks iteration times faster and make it easier for them to be working with the project. So we've already talked a bit about how we need to you know, have tools and things like of that. A key aspect is to also that ties in with that is designing systems that scale. So something that can scale in terms of being used for an extended time period, scale with large amounts of data, large amounts of you know, things running at a particular point in time, something that we can maintain is really important. So a key to this is technical design. And tech design matters, but what matters more is effective tech design. So 50 pages of documentation that not on a particular system that no one looks at is useless. If, no, if it's so much that it's too difficult to find anything, then that's not going to help with the project. Also, having five sentences that don't really say anything of depth is not going to be helpful. So the tech design that we put together has to be effective. And so we want to find a middle ground that documents things well enough that someone new starting on a project can easily navigate the code. That's sort of an important thing to begin with. The technical design, in part, is a bit of a roadmap of being able to find where things are. So it needs to be easy, 
to parse, easy to process, and it should make it something that a new person to a project, so not necessarily someone who's you know, new to coding, but someone who's new to the project can easily navigate that code. So it has to be easy to find things in it. So make use of, you know, linking between sections, make use of, you know, again, similar processes to what we're talking about with naming and organizing our files and folders. Have things organized in logical ways, have things named in logical ways, have things like tables of contents, make it easy to find the information that people need. If there's you know, common troubleshooting steps for a system, if there is specific cheat commands or tools associated with it, document those. If there's test levels, mention that as well. Keep it that it's useful and easy to find things in it. And big thing, has to be easy to keep up to date. There is no point in having technical design for a system and then that system gets expanded on and built on over years and the technical design is still the version from four years ago and is completely out of date. Like that doesn't help uh, anyone for working with the project. So we need to make sure that we keep things up to date. So really tiny things don't need tech design. But as soon as you would describe something as a system, that absolutely does need technical design. Also, a modification to a system, changing the way that it behaves. Even if it's an existing system, changing the way a system behaves does require technical design. And part of the reason for putting together these things like technical design is so that it can be something that, as well as it being a navigable tool for new people to a project, it's also something that you can then get reviewed, that you can discuss with others and get feedback on to identify things that you might have missed. And we're always going to miss things. That happens. We document and get others to review it so we find the things that we've missed. So having technical design for anything beyond a sort of very small, very trivial change is really important. But the level of technical design should scale with the scale of the system being developed and also how critical it is. You know, a small system that is super critical is probably going to warrant a higher level of detail in the design than something that is might be a large system, but not super critical. So something to keep in mind there, figure out what's the appropriate middle ground for each system. So related to technical design, we've got to pick the right tools and technologies. And there's a lot of ones out there and picking the right one matters. You know, just in Unity alone, it's a case of, okay, are we using built-in pipeline? Are we using universal pipeline? Are we using the high def pipeline? Now that's getting easier to switch between those, which is great. In the pipelines, there's a level of convergence there, which is great. That And there's sort of you know, steps that Unity has flagged they're going to be taking to make that switching process a lot easier, which is excellent. Uh, but it still takes effort and there's still things that work in one that are not going to work in others. So making sure we pick the right one is important. And the key thing there is we need to test things out before locking them in. You know, we don't just decide, okay, cool, we're just going to use universal pipeline. Let's not worry about considering you know, any, any sort of major aspects for it. You don't want to just lock things in without due consideration. So things that we want to look for are what do we currently need it to be able to do? And what do our future needs look like? Will that tech handle it out of the box? Will it handle it with modifications? If it will handle it with modifications, do, you know, does the team already have the knowledge in-house to make those changes? Because you know, that impacts on if you need to potentially recruit people that can do those areas. You need to also think, not just, okay, what do the future needs look like, but really think out of the box. 
What is the most out there things you might need it to do? Because, you know, as you, as games change and expand, you know, the, the design and so forth for a game can vary a lot, especially in the early stages of development. So being able to test out really sort of, you know, out there blue sky ideas uh, with tech is really important. So properly stress test things uh, when you're actually evaluating a bit of technology. Don't just, you know, rely on any sort of provided samples. Really push those to get a sense of is it going to do not just what you need now and what you need in the future, but is it going to deal with what sort of stuff you're in the wildest dreams you might add in. So look at how well it handles those. And you know, if you're needing to modify it, one thing is the skill set. The other thing is, are you actually able to? Uh, and this is one of the things that, without going off on too much of a tangent, it's one of the things that I do dislike about Unity, the fact that it's closed source as it is. Uh, I think it's actually to their detriment because I've seen the benefit that Unreal has gained from getting input from countless developers over decades. Uh, and that has really helped them to improve the tool. And Unity is kind of missing out by not having that. So that's something where you know, you might be using an add-on and you might not be able to actually modify it or it might require a different license to be able to do that. So that's something to be uh, very mindful of, of not just do you have the skill set to modify it, but is it even actually possible to do that? And how easy is it to do that? So that's something where I'll often do from evaluating some new bit of tech. I will do tests like that of, okay, I want to try and change it so it can do this thing that it currently can't do. Let's see how easy I can do that. Is the code well designed enough to handle that? Or is it a case that it's very difficult to do? The support for it is really important. I've worked with tools and tech where the support has been really terrible and that makes it very difficult and very slow, in particular if you run into major issues. Also been very fortunate to work with, uh, and for the most part, tools and tech where the support is fantastic and we're being able to get really good support and be able to get that really quickly from you know, the actual supplier. So looking at that support, getting an understanding of what that arrangement is and how that works is really important there as well. Now, nearly sort of look at, you know, at the end of all the things looking at, version control and automation. So version control, as I mentioned, is, an, is a must, regardless of the size of the project. Even if this is a project that you're only working on for a day, put it in version control. Never just be like, no, we're not going to worry about version control. And version control doesn't mean uploading a copy to Google Drive or Dropbox. It means actual version control where you can easily tell what's been changed. So it's a must. Please never work on a project that's not using something for version control. Uh, unless what they're using for version control is, you know, something really, 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 really terrible, but I don't think anyone's using Visual Source Safe anymore. Uh, that's something that goes back, I, th I think it ceased being used about 20 to 30 years ago. I remember using it about 30 years ago, no, 20 years ago, and it was, it was, yeah, don't recommend it. So using good version control. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of very good version control options out there that are generally pretty affordable. So, Good processes with version control are also important. So it's not just using the version control, but having good processes with it. So having things like code and content reviews. So this is something where, uh, in particular in medium, larger size studios, you'll see uh, this often as a regular part of practice is certainly on the code side, 
uh, and on the end at times with the content side in particular if near a milestone doing reviews so the idea behind this is you make your set of changes available someone reviews it and you know, you can either it can be something where you're talking them through it or where they're looking through it and they're asking questions and that happens before it goes into the version control and this is a really valuable process i've worked at studios that have done this and i've worked at studios that have not done this uh the difference in bug counts was dramatic <laughs> Uh, and the one that didn't do uh, code reviews, there was a very, very, very large number of bugs uh, because there wasn't those good processes. But it's also not just that reviews help develop, you know, give you good processes and spot problems early. They also help skill folks up because when code reviews happen, it's not just the case where, okay, you know, a senior pro senior AI programmer is only reviewing changes, you know, from other senior programmers or only AI ones, things like of that. Code reviews should happen, you know, the, the reviewer could be someone of any level of experience. The reviewer could be any, someone of, you know, any area of specialization or, or generalization within a project. And the advantage is, is that, you know, people with different experiences are going to see different things, which is great, spots more problems. Also, builds up the general knowledge of the entire team of the code base and that's really valuable like it, it it's a tool actually for teaching and skilling folks up so code reviews really beneficial you learn a lot from doing them and you also help minimize the amount of bugs content reviews similar gains there the main challenge with content reviews is they're often a lot more difficult to do because you know you can't really go and you know, diff a 3D model or you know, diff a sound file in a way that's super meaningful. So that's something where code is very easy to do that with. Content is more difficult, but you can talk through the changes there. And again, it's still an opportunity for learning and for building up a greater understanding. Having good commit messages, really important. You know, a commit message where it's a case of change stuff fix things doesn't really help so having processes where you're you know if there's tasks or bugs linking to those having stuff where you're explaining what's actually happened in it because if something goes wrong and you're trying to figure out well what changes might have caused this being able to look through the commit messages should let you easily identify okay is this something that could be a factor or is it definitely not a factor so really handy to have good commit messages there. Making sure you're branching, tagging, things like of that for major milestones is great so that you can, you know, if need be, have people working in parallel, be able to always have, you know, an archived copy of things. These are really valuable to be able to do that. Automated builds, so we're getting over to the automation side of things. So you also hear this referred to as continuous integration. Uh, and associated with that, at times automated tests. So automated builds are really important. I recommend on any major project, that's something you want to set up early on because there's a lot of problems that have a nasty habit of they will only show up in a build. So being able to have those builds happening means that you can be testing them much more readily. If you're developing for multiple platforms, also means from a very early on stage, you can actually be testing that it works to build for other platforms because you know, each platform might have particular different requirements and you can get cases where some code will build for one platform, but then it won't build for another. And you know, because they might be using different tool chains for actually doing the compilation there. Uh, so some of the different tool chains can be a little bit more uh, pedantic about stuff, which can be good in many ways because you can catch problems. So automated builds, really important with any large project. I can I consider them an absolute must. Automated tests 
are also really important. They're difficult at times to set up with games, in particular things like you know, being able to test out gameplay or if you've got you know, AI characters, things like that, it can be really difficult to automate and test those. Uh, so it is definitely more work. But even as a minimum, doing things like testing that it can load every level, testing that it can spawn in different characters is valuable. And having things on top of that where you can start to test gameplay is really important because these are ways to find problems early, to establish, to build stability, and then maintain it. And this is one of the big things with large projects. We want to build a stable foundation and then continue to be able to build and expand on top of that. That's a really key aspect with it. So automated builds, automated testing are really important to be establishing early on with a large project. So to wrap things up, mistakes are going to happen with projects. And in particular, large projects, there's a lot of scope for having mistakes happen. But we learn from them. And that's a really important thing. And when we learn from them, try and make sure you actually share what you're learning from that. That's why things like postmortems for projects, in particular public postmortems, are really valuable because then you, know, you can learn from pitfalls, things that other developers have run into. So learning from them is the key thing. You know, and our goal is always going to be to keep the potential scale and cost of those mistakes low to find ways of preventing it in future. So we try and test high risk things early, you know, and this comes into sort of the scheduling side of things, but testing high risk things early, testing things carefully and thoroughly so that we know early on that we've got a good confidence of whether things are going to work and whether our most, you know, ridiculous, you know, dream ideas are going to actually be possible. It keeps that scale of mistakes lower. So it keeps that stake lower. Uh, you know, a mistake early on in a project is far better than a mistake three months from ship, uh, especially if it's a major you know, sort of tech issue. So we want to hit those early. So that's my general guidance on approaching structuring a large project. Uh, as I said, it's something where there is a lot to it. And the key thing is we're trying to front load risk. We're trying to allow us to iterate rapidly and we're trying to create and maintain a point of stability. Uh, so that's sort of the key things that are different with a large project. So we need more processes. We do slow things down a bit so that we maintain that stability and that's good. And we slow them down and get things stable so that when we need to move quickly, we're moving quickly on a stable platform as opposed to moving quickly on a very unstable platform, uh, which makes a big difference in terms of the potential for you know, things going right and wrong there. So I hope you have enjoyed the video. And if you've got any questions, do chuck in a comment below. If there's other things in this area that you would like me to be talking about or any of the areas you'd like me to drill down into more detail on, please do mention that in a comment. It's really helpful. Uh, if you have found the video interesting and helpful, check out like and subscribe. It really helps out. It's really appreciated. Uh, if you are looking for any of the things I mentioned in the video, I have put a uh, links in the descriptions to where you can find things like the naming conventions from Epic and so forth. And if you are looking for other ways to support the channel, I do have a Patreon, and there's a link to that in the description below as well. But until next time, 